So, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to EFC Spotlight Talk on role of crystallization in the production of battery materials and in battery recycling by the Working Party on Crystallization. I'm uh, Giorgio Veronese, I'm president of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering. I've been in the board of EFC for six years with two terms in the position of executive uh, vice president. Then I was nominated last September president for the term 22-23. I'm a chemical engineer by training, graduated in Padua, Italy, and I've been spending the whole of my career in the engineering construction business, involved in many projects around the world with uh, several long assignments uh, overseas. My personal experience is project management, company management, and commercial activities. I'm very happy to be involved in the introduction of this webinar on the role of crystallization in the production of battery materials and in battery recycling, a very important aspect in the current transition towards uh, sustainable energy and in particular electrical uh, mobility. Let me say something about the Spotlight Talks. Uh, EFC is organizing a series of webinars on significant topics in chemical engineering. This is our third year of this initiative, which started in 2020 to keep together the community, the chemical engineering community, in spite of the restriction imposed by the COVID pandemic. The success of the previous years convinced the management of, of EFC to carry on and to organize new series of spotlight talks and actually to include them in our regular program. In this series of April 22, eight of our technical groups, working parties and sections, which are CAPE, crystallization, drying, education, high pressure technologies, mixing, multi-phase fluid flow, membrane engineering, have been delivering over these two weeks a short session of talks focused on specific topics by leading industrial and academic experts. This is the last one of the series, and I'm happy to report that all feedbacks so far were quite positive about the outcome. Uh, one aspect is that uh, the series may also enable attendees to explore matters in areas that they find interesting, but may not have the opportunity to attend before. In this way, we want to encourage cross-fertilization uh, between specialist areas. In general, EFC promotes scientific collaboration and supports the work of chemical engineers in 30 European countries, representing more than 100,000 in Europe. The working parties and sections cover all major specific aspects of chemical engineering and are in fact at the core of the organization, forming the scientific engine or backbone that drives many of the EFC activities. They provide an important forum for technical exchange, and this is a typical example of what you're doing, uh, among the chemical engineers in Europe. Uh, before concluding, I would like to, to thank all the people who work hard inside the working parties, the sections, and the EFC in general, for this uh, initiative to happen and to be successful. In particular, many thanks to EFC Martin Pou in Toulouse, who did most of the work from the conceptual phase to the final organizational details. So again, many thanks, Martin. And having said that, I would like to wish all the speakers and the attendees a fruitful and successful webinar and give back the floor to Professor Daniele Marchisio, Chair of the Working Party on Crystallization, to start the works. Daniele, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Giorgio, uh, for the introduction. And thank you very much, uh, Martin, for the organization, uh, which has been excellent. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So I'm going to start with um, um, a couple of technical uh, announcements before I forget. Uh, all the attendees are not enabled to speak. So uh, the proper way to ask a question is to use the question and answer box. So you will see in the Zoom um, icon, uh, one specific box uh, called the question and answer. So please uh, put your questions there. And also, um, I like to remind everybody that uh, uh, this spotlight talk is recorded and will be available probably already starting from next week on the EFCE uh, YouTube channel. So um, 
As it has been said, well, I mean, um, first of all, um, let me introduce myself. My name is Daniele Marchisio. I'm a chemical engineer as a background, and I'm a professor of chemical engineering in Politecnico di Torino. And as it has been said, the title of this spotlight talk is Role of Crystallization in the Production of Battery Materials and in Battery Recycling. Uh, we have a series of very exciting talks uh, with contributions from industry and academia covering different topics. And uh, I believe everybody is uh, familiar with uh, uh, the reason why uh, we care so much about batteries. Uh, there are political reasons and uh, um, environmental reasons why we should uh, uh, become independent from fossil fuels, in particular oil and gas. And uh, uh, that means that we have to go for renewables, uh, but renewables are intermittent in nature. And so we need to have energy storage. There are different energy storage systems that the chemical engineering community is working on uh, for stationary applications, but also for the automotive sector. Uh, the technology is different, but of course, uh, batteries play a very uh, important role. So I believe everybody is familiar with uh, what a battery is. Um, here, I'm just reporting a slide explaining the functioning of a lithium ion battery, which is the most popular rechargeable battery. Long story short, you have uh, uh, chemical species fluxing from one electrode to the, uh, to the other during charge and discharge. And you have also electrons fluxing. And uh, um, there are uh, many uh, type of batteries. Typically, they are classified in terms of their volumetric energy density and the gra gravimetric energy density, which tell you how large and how heavy the battery is. And in this region, I hope you can see my cursor. In this region, we have uh, uh, lithium ion batteries, uh, but then there are also others. Uh, it is also interesting to have a look at this plot in which the energy density is plotted versus the power density. And here you have different energy storage systems. And here you have the internal combustion engine. So you see that, especially for automotive applications, there is still a long way to go to reach uh, uh, this level of performance. Why um, is crystallization important in this field? There are many reasons. Uh, one reason is that crystallization plays a very important role in the production of battery materials. For example, cathodes for lithium ion batteries are made of different uh, uh, systems. Uh, but one of the most popular is called NMC, uh, and the precursor for NMC is nickel, manganese, cobalt hydroxides with different composition of nickel, manganese, and cobalt. And uh, the standard way to produce this material is through precipitation. In this plot, you can see the amount of uh, uh, materials, cathode materials, that uh, uh, we will have to produce in the years to come. And this gray region corresponds to what is expected to be uh, the role of uh, um, NMC. Um, so as I said, uh, just an example, NMC is produced through crystallization. So here you can see some um, 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 simple uh, flow sheets explaining how the process works. We will hear from the talks. Um, uh, also these in details. Of course, there, is, there are also other routes, uh, as for example, the gas phase synthesis, but the wet route synthesis, the precipitation and crystallization mode um, is also um, uh, extremely competitive. Um, let me skip this one. And uh, let me also stress that um, uh, precipitation and crystallization play an important role in uh, uh, recycling, because after mechanical and thermal treatment, after and after uh, treatment with uh, solutions, uh, you have a bunch of very important uh, uh, components, very important species, metals in particular, that you need to recover and crystallize. Crystallization and precipitation is a very efficient way to, uh, to recover this. Um, so um, in, in the several talks, we will address uh, several issues. Uh, including also uh, the problem of uh, recovering critical raw materials from uh, uh, in innovative ways, uh, as for example, the case of lithium and uh, magnesium, um, um, which uh, will be covered in uh, the last talk. So having said that, I think I can stop sharing my screen and I can start uh, introducing the first uh, speaker. So the first speaker is uh, Lucas Metzger uh, from BSF. Hello, Lucas. Good morning. 
So Lucas um, got his PhD at the KIT in Karlsruhe uh, with the thesis uh, titled Understanding uh, Precipitation Processes via Rigorous Modeling, uh, and in particular using CFT. Since uh, December 2016, he has been working in BSF in the uh, Competence Center uh, for Crystallization and now in the Research Engineer Crystallization and Precipitation Team. He is uh, a member of the advisory board in the German, uh, in the German Working Party on Crystallization. Uh, he has been involved uh, in BSF uh, uh, in the Battery uh, Materials Operating Division of BSF and is heavily involved in academic cooperations and model developments for a uh, deeper understanding of battery precursor precipitation and the correlation of process structure performance. And uh, this is also what the uh, topic of his presentation is going to be. Lucas, the floor is yours. You have approximately 20 minutes, and then we have 10 minutes for questions and answers. Thanks a lot, Daniel, for this fantastic introduction. And a warm welcome also from my side. I'm happy to have today the opportunity in this framework to present an industrial perspective on battery material precursor production. And um, yeah, so just start with my thought. So if we, just a second. So if we should start, just, I'll pick the laser pointer. If we look on established value chains for battery material production for electromobility, so we see there are a variety of process steps. So starting from the raw materials, typically from mining, you have a certain refining of these materials. And then you end up in this active materials, um, which are namely cathode active material, anode materials, and certain additives or binders, for example. Further on manufacturing those uh, materials and you, you can then build up such beautiful pouch cells. You have certain process steps like coating, you have uh, calendaring, and then you can build up those pouch cells, introducing them into such a battery system with a with an, um, temperature programming, with a safety management. You really can um, end up in a battery that you can further on built in such a vehicle. And now let's focus on the materials. So since I'm working at BSF, we're mainly focused on this cathode active material where you really can adjust the capacity of such a battery. And you can do a, a lot of things right, but you can also do a lot of things wrong. And what is important to know is um, when you look on this whole process chain to understand some impacts that you have in your material, you, you really have to test it in the final battery. And uh, it's all about process structure performance. So it's really important to look on the whole value chain and to understand how does, for example, the, the precipitation process here affects later on the performance in the battery. With this now, I'd like to introduce the industrial synthesis route for such materials. So typically we start with the co-precipitation as Daniele already introduced. You start with the feeds from the metal salts, sodium hydroxide, and typically we use ammonia, or which is established in industry. And you end up in such a beautiful spherical particle from nickel cobalt manganese hydroxides. This is typically done in such vessel type operations. And uh, afterwards, you, have, uh, you add a lithium source, you add elevated temperature, you do a calcination, and you end up in lithiated nickel cobalt manganese oxide, which is already your cathode active material. But there are, to protect those materials in the cell, there are certain post treatment steps necessary, which, for example, is such a coating with there are different ways possible atomic layer deposition or other methods to do this. And in the end, you really have a material which you can further on proceed into films, you can code it, and you can proceed, proce process your battery. And what is important to know, I mean, we have a certain morphological change from the precursor to, in the calcination step, but it's important to know a lot of parameters that you adjust in your precipitation stay present in the later material. That means if you do a precipitation quite bad and you have a, like a bad product, you will never end up with a good material, battery material. Here you can really do a lot good, but you can also do a lot wrong. And um, now let's have a look on this, uh, this field here, just to introduce a bit the history. So we're in this field, we, we see a certain evolution. Um, 
typically it started with NCM 111 or 622, which is quite popular to give you an outline. So we have this through three um, metals involved with cobalt, which is quite expensive, also toxic. And uh, as you already know, typically it's ethically questionable where, where the mining is done. So one, one decided to get rid from the cobalt. We have nickel, which has the highest capacity, but also has brings some safety issues. So producing a pure nickel oxide battery is, is quite tough in, in, in handling. And we have manganese, which is cheaper, but also has a lower energy density, but a high thermal stability. And so it's always like a, a, like a blend between the three pop properties. And at the moment, the evolution is towards high nickel materials. So we have NCM188 or even higher at the moment. But there's also a trend in the market where we see high manganese material. Today, I'd like to focus on this high nickel material. What you see, recipes are changing all the time and and it's quite and the the speed of of development is quite high so have, we have fast product cycles we, we recipes vary and this also changes the the properties and the behavior in for example in precipitation and there we need really high agile process development and rather flexible assets to give you an idea what is bsf doing at the moment in Europe. So here you see our European battery investments. On the one hand side, we have in Harja Walter, Finland, uh, our uh, PCAM production plant that is that will ramp up his production this year, which will be quite, quite, quite challenging and and really exciting for us. Um, and here you see a bit older press release image from 2021, uh, which is our cathode active plant in Schwarzheide in Germany. Uh, you can imagine this building is already finished and now also starting to be to, to ramp up. But one has to say the market in the market environment for European companies is quite tough. So Asian market is, is strong. The capex building such buildings in Europe is much higher and it's really tough to, to be competitive and um, to meet the high quality restrictions that the companies and the customers desire. Let's have a look on such precursor material now. So we, uh, our spotlight talk is today about precipitation and crystallization. So I'd like to focus on this section. And there are a lot of, of parameters we have to adjust and that are recommended and, and uh, restricted by the customer. For example, size and size distribution is super important. Uh, the customer needs 14 micron particles in D50 with a span of 0.5, for example, and you have to meet it with your precipitation. We need, we have to adjust high particles for us, sphericity. Only a, an, an, a required amount of impurity inclusions is is, is uh, possible. For example, sulfate is, is typically found in the structure. Uh, I, I'll refer to this later on. But we also see like topics like primary particles, shape orientation. When you do a cross section of those particles, you see a certain orientation of your primaries. You can have nickel manganese segregation or you and which is also very important and affects the BT surface, for example, is porosity. And uh, now let, I'd, I'd like to focus on a few of those points. I mean, the time is not too long to, to do this, but um, Initially, I'd like to, to introduce a few classes of, of battery materials, and you have to be we, we have to be capable to, to deliver all of them. So you need highly flexible assets. On the one hand side, we have those CCR materials with a broad span. You can really reach high press densities in the end, which which reach in high capacity. On the other hand side, we have this narrow span material, which is batch material, where you can really get uniform particles very spherish, which is which can really meet a certain D50 uh, with, a, with a narrow span. And there are further derivatives, as you can imagine. So typically we use multi-stage processes, also high solid processes where you increase the solid content, for example, with a thickener or, or a clarifier uh, to, to Im improve your, your growth conditions in the reactor. We have single crystal materials, which is used to be planned. So this is typically referring to small material in the range of four to six microns. So you needed to blend those large materials to get like the, the high performing batteries, for example, as, as in your, your mobile device, or for example, gradient material is also a topic. So you see a broad span we have to, to cover. And now let's have a look on, on such, on the, on the nature of this precipitation. So 
here on the left hand side you see early stages of those precipitates you see like we have this uh, the, this uh, layer double hydroxide uh, from from those uh, platelet structures we see some twinning and um, we have this small tiny platelet particles and um, after a certain consolidation you end up even depending on the regime you operate your process when you operate in the nucleation regime you end up like with an agglomerate of, of a lot of nuclei when you're in an intermediate regime you can also build such potato shaped particles no one know, wants and the best and that is typically what what the what the customers are asking for are those very spherish particles beautifully grown and um with, with, with a very structured order and um, yeah, I'm happy to, to present today a few slides of our PhD, Raphael Berg, who's, who's doing his PhD at Technical University of Munich, who provided me those slides. And here, I'd like to hike with you th through such a precipitation process. You see here the initial part. So we start at five minutes, so early process time. We, you see the, the broad span. You see your early nucleus measured in a master sizer here. And um, you see here on the top you see the evolution of of the mean particle size over time and now we go step by step through the process so this is early stage you see immediate undefined aggregated particles consist out of this tiny twin primary particles now we're at one hour and you see those particles seem to to consolidate so they they build a hierarchical structure and moving on in the process at two hours, we see a distinct growth. So particles start to grow anisotropic. So in lateral direction towards the, uh, the outer, towards the outer side. And um, yeah, following this process at, at, for example, here at almost four hours, you see like uh, the continuous growth lead like to, a, to a, um, this a redemption of this spherical shape structure from the initial aggregate and you the more we, we grow those materials and you see it's here it's a very porous material um we this this spherical um shape is healed and we get more and more roundish and here in the end so we, we're now at eight eight hours you see we have rather round particles i mean here one has to say this is no industrial vessel this was a lab vessel Another interesting thing that was uh, discovered by, by Raphael, and he presented this at the ISIC last year, uh, is the, the fact that depending on the pH you do your precipitation, you end up with certain porosities. And uh, this you can see also in the BT surface. So high poros higher porosity leads to higher BT surface. And you see at increasing pH, your porosity decreases. And you see also this behavior in the cross section of such a particle. And um, what we also found that this somehow correlates with the sulfate content we found in the structure. And here, Raphael made a nice study from XRD results. And he found out that by, and it's important to, to look now in this plot where you see the vertical crystallite size of this plateless particles uh, versus the residual sulfate content in the structure. You see that the more sulfate you get in the structure, the lower is the height growth of such a crystallite. And uh, this was quite interesting and brought up the hypothesis that at a low bulk pH, uh, where we have uh, only pure amount of, of hydroxides in solution, uh, for a lot of sulfate adsorbs on the structure um, and blocks the height growth. So we also know there are phases or nickel hydroxide can also intercalate such sulfate uh, ions. And at higher pH, uh, this the, the sulfate adsorption is it's way lower and so you get much denser structures and this is not something new so we know for example here is, is from from Messman crystallization technology handbook we know the impact of some additives on the growth of certain planes in in, in solution and for example here it's the impact of iron on ammonium dihydrogen phosphate but we also know this for uh, ammonium sulfate and the impact of alumina for example and um, so Actually, the sulfate is, let's say, the is the triggers the porosity we need. If you do your precipitation, for example, with chlorides or nitrates, you do not find those porous structures. And here, to zoom up, so you can see really on a low pH, where you have the more porous system, you have the blocked height growth. You see more 
twin system, but, but more tiny platelet structures at higher pH with low sulfate intercalation where height growth is not reduced that much, you see a more enlarged structure and more height growth. Also in the cross section, so this is a, a particle cut in the, in the middle, uh, you, you, you can see this effect in porosity. And you can imagine you have different, different conditions for a lithium ion diffusing into this structure in such a material in, in, in contrast to such a material. Uh, now I'd like uh, to hurry up a bit, but uh, I'd like to uh, highlight some, some computer-aided production support methods we're developing at the moment. And here I'd like to highlight the work of David Guse, who is working uh, in a cooperation with us at Castro Institute of Technology. He does, he does some thermodynamic modeling of such systems. And here you see like by, by adding more and more hydroxide and you see on which species are relevant in the system. And you can also see that, for example, for the nickel species, the ammonia complexation is very important. Whereas for a manganese system, uh, ammonia does not play a crucial role. So you can really play with the ammonia to, to, to blend between the two, two ions. Converting this into such a supersaturation map, you see, for example, here pH versus supersaturation at a certain concentration of the metal. You can see also the impact how ammonia, for example, dampens the supersaturation. So you can really go from a nucleation dominated regime into a growth dominated regime, which we need to build up this beautiful spherish particles. And if you now insert those metals models also in, into a CFD framework, and you add also some kinetics, such, such as uh, classical nucleation theory and the growth term, you can also get some ideas on, for example, which nucleation rate do we get in such vessels, which growth rates do we have? And we compare this, for example, with MSMPR measured rates. Um, and this is quite, quite interesting and then really helps us to establish a proper scale up chain from lab vessel to a large production vessel. Here, for example, you see it's, it's only like, like a, a small pilot demo video, but you can see now we, we extended this for co-precipitation solvent. Now we, we consider all three ions since they have a certain different solubility over pH, for example, in our vessel. And we also find such gradients, for example, in our materials. So as already said, we have an this helps us to, to develop such a scale-up pipeline. And another cooperation I'd like to highlight is with the University of Manchester. This is with Professor Mike Anderson, who developed a Monte Carlo method called Crystal Crower, which enables to, um, to by knowing the, the XRD signal of, or the XRD information of single crystal of a single crystal, you can really grow such materials and, and by feeding it also with input from, from, uh, from, from uh, quantum chemistry, you can, for example, grow such particles. And here we have no twinning involved as, as far as, but, but you can also see like how this structures are built. This is at low sulfate intercalation. And you can also see at high sulfate intercalation how this surf height growth is blocked. So to come to an end, so this is actually my last slide. And today the focus for, of my talk was the precursor material. But as you can imagine, there are many other topics around. So on the one hand side, we have, uh, we, we need circular economy to be, to be um, competitive on the market. So here a press release of our uh, new battery recycling prototype plant in Schwarzheide, which is in, in, a, in a building phase at the moment. And I'm happy to announce here the, the two upcoming presentations of Beatrice Bisca and Maya Rinne. And um, another topic, which is probably not too sexy, but is, is really, uh, yeah, makes us some headache, is um, how to deal with the massive amounts of sodium sulfate you get in your pecan production. Because I mean, you, you have your sodium uh, metal hydroxide precipitation, but you end up with a massive amount of sodium sulfate you have to get rid of. And there are, and here it's also, typical discipline for crystallization and precipitation. Do you go the, the typical wastewater treatment way by gypsum, a trinket route? Do you go via a fertilizer, for example, the, the potassium sulfate via the glyceride route or ammonium sulfate? Or what is also quite inter interesting uh, and in investigation at the moment is the bipolar electrodialysis, where you end up in the end with your sodium sulfate in sodium hydroxide again and in sulfuric acid. So. 
large questions to, to be handled in the future. And with this, I thank you for your attention and here really special thanks to our PhD students, Raphael Berg, David Guse and Steven Tendera. Thank you. Thank you and very I'm much. I'm open for Lucas. your question. Yeah, thank you very much, Lucas. That was uh, very interesting and uh, uh, straight to the point. So uh, there are already a few questions. Um, I'm gonna start uh, uh, reading the first one. Um, so the first one refers to slide number three. And it says, is there a difference between lithium hydroxide uh, dot uh, uh, water or lithium carbonate in the calcination step? Yeah, it is. So it, I mean, it's on the one hand side, it's the carbon footprint you have in the process, which is rather important for, for also for our economic evaluation, but it also makes something with the structure. So if, for example, carbonate or CO2 has to leave the system, you're, you get a more porous structure. Okay. Instead of water. Yeah. Then there is another question concerning um, where the lithium comes from. Uh, as lithium source, you have typically lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide. And when would you use which of these sources? Um, tough to, to answer for me since I'm, I'm a competence center crystallization precipitation and not involved in the whole value chain. Um, if you would send me this question, I, I can hand it over, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't answer it in, in, a, in a manner that, that would be sufficient for you, I guess. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, um, um, we will uh, manage that. Um, so the, the speaker can, uh, can, for example, write you an email and then uh, um, the, the, the answer can be provided later on. Well, um, so um, another question is, um, do you know which other impurities are having an impact on the precipitation uh, besides pH and uh, sulfate, sulfate in particular, which you, dis you discussed? Uh, yeah, we do, or and we are investigating this issue. Because um, I mean, you can imagine if we do, if we have an, we have this ongoing battery recycling activity, and it's very important to know which specification we do we have in the end on our <coughs> recycled material. But uh, yeah, I hope it's it's okay for you that I cannot go into depth in, into or into details here. Okay. Um... Have you another question? Have you looked at the effects of processing conditions, pH, time, mixing on the electrochemical performance? So not only you know the link of process condition to particle size and morphology, but also the link between particle size, morphology, and electrochemical performance in terms of uh, cycling uh, over a very long period of time. Is that something that you do in the in your lab? Yeah, great question. So yeah, this is actually super important to do this so we, we we cover the whole value chain and until ec testing otherwise and and every customer wants to see this right so if you if you have a new material you you have to to show some founded information that your material performs well and uh so so we have cycling routines we have certain profiles we, we do there for for ec testing and this is quite important yes otherwise you wouldn't see all the the effects in the end Mm -hmm. okay. But that also blows up your DOE, right? You have you have calcination, you have coating step, you have you have also like a, a bunch of steps you have to cover, and they they have to be constant. Otherwise, you cannot com compare any precipitation condition parameter. Right. So maybe a very quick follow up question on uh, on this last point. Um, because we do have these three steps, co-precipitation, calcination, post-treatment, and then you test the final performance of the material when you assemble it together, you produce the electrode, and then you put it in a battery. Um, so, you know, the crystallization community is mainly interested in the precipitation step, but then, you know, you take the powder, filter, filter it, and then you calcinate it. How much memory does the material have after calcination? I mean, if you had to quantify how much each of these three steps is important, are they equally important or is the first step the most important? If you don't get it right, then, you know, no matter you do afterwards with calcination and post-treatment, the material will not have the right performance. 
yeah i understand your question it's tough to say but as i as i said so if you do the precipitation bad you you cannot save the material in the end if you start with good co-precipitate or with a good precursor and you you vary for example calcination temperature coating process you, you will find a sweet spot in your material so if you do the initial state fully wrong forget it and uh, this is probably important to know so so therefore the the focus on on the precipitation step is is quite important okay all right so um there are still questions uh, which are the level of porosity expected to a good performance of the material so i think here um Andresa is the person who is asking the question is referring to the internal porosity of the crystals yeah uh, it's it's not that easy to answer since different applications require different materials so for example a dense material is uh, needs more time to charge but has also a, lo a, a longer release of of, of energy uh, for example more porous material is, is quicker to charge and and the discharge is also quite fast so this is more for for uh, high power applications so it's also depend on the application where you need your material um and uh yeah so so this is really you you have you have to to look on the certain specific application Daniel yes um I, yeah, can okay. you, now i can yeah. hear you again yeah perfect i lost connection i guess yeah no the, there is there has been a um a um a um, blackout here so we are um, i'm using now my phone to connect uh, and uh, there's no electricity but i have a very good battery on my uh, laptop so yeah, great end of the seminar all right, so yeah, I, um, I missed the very last part of the answer, but I'm, I'm interested in asking, I'm interested in another point. Let me ask you one last question. So the morphology of these particles uh, is extremely complex, right? And you have all these phenomena going on over time. Um, and then you have many phenomena. You have uh, primary nucleation, growth, aggregation, probably also breakage. But then uh, this is a process, as you showed, that uh, um, takes quite a lot of time to produce the material that you want. So probably you also have some secondary nucleation. Do you have a feeling of uh, which of these mechanisms is the most important? And uh, from the modeling point of view, is it useful for you, uh, in your opinion, to develop a model that really accounts for all these uh, phenomena and corresponding rates? Or you know, just mapping supersaturation in the reactor uh, without any uh, kinetics taken into account would be enough. Yeah, great, great question. Um, since actually, this is tough to answer. So I mean, at the moment, I do not have an, have a clue on how to cover all those phenomena and to to cover this hierarchical structure, for example, properly. Um, but what we found so far is focusing on the primary processes, and this is quite interesting. I mean, in the end, you adjust a certain particle size of the secondaries. And this is really dependent on the nuclei you initially insert in the process. So it's quite interesting if you track, for example, the, the nuclei per volume that are formed initially, that correlates in the end to the particle size where you end up so it's like how much seed material you give in the in the process and um, decides on where you end up i mean we, we work with certain descriptors for example to get information about sphericity about agglomeration tendency but um, the focus on primary particles is not that bad because it really affects in the end the whole process if you start with too much primaries you always end up in this fully aggregated regime which is uh, yeah which is not desired from the customer all right well thank you very much lucas i think we need to move to the next uh, uh, lecture uh, please and the presentation will be given by maria rinne 
who is a doctoral candidate at Aalto University in Finland. Her research focuses on the simulation and life cycle assessment of novel hydrometallurgical processes and particularly the treatment of waste uh, batteries. So, Maria, the stage is yours. We can see your presentation. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And uh, nice to see so many people attending this presentation. Indeed, I am Maria Rinne. My background is in, in, in process metallurgy and, and recycling, um, not necessarily in, in crystallization. And uh, looking a little bit more towards the bigger picture of, of processing and, and battery, battery life cycle is what I'm going to be discussing in this presentation. Um, yes, um, just to highlight that Finland is quite a large player in the European battery metal section uh, sector. Uh, for example, Finland is the second biggest uh, exporter of global uh, refined cobalt in the world, but we also have cobalt mining, nickel, nickel mining and, and, and uh, some refineries that are highly interesting just on the primary primary side. Also lithium production that is going to be starting in a few years. Uh, also graphite resources that we have are discussed a little bit less. And uh, lots of, of collaboration between the industry and, and the academia, which has been very beneficial for, for, this, for this topic also. Um, but uh, obviously, we have been discussing a lot about why battery recycling is so necessary, basically the electrification of transport, but there are other aspects as well. Uh, some the environmental benefits will not be seen for a very long time because primary metal production, basically mining will be needed needed so long, but recycling also benefits in terms of saving finite resources. This is also a political topic, as we have seen during the past few months. And these batteries are hazardous, uh, flammable, and so forth. So landfilling is them is not an option anyways. Um, but if recycling batteries was easy, then we would be already doing it very well. But as it stands, very low volume of the materials is actually recovered from batteries. Over 50% of battery weight is quite easy to recover just because of the casing and so forth. But the cell materials themselves are quite poorly recovered. Uh, lithium is not recovered at all. Phosphate or the electrolyte, electrolyte is not aluminum perhaps, but not, not from the current collectors. And, and graphite is another, is not recovered. So this basically leaves cobalt, nickel, copper. Some cases manganese, but quite rarely. And uh, iron, not from the cathodes. Cathode chemistries is not recoverable either. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done to improve the actual final recycling rates and recycle efficiency. But, so, but at the moment, the processes are designed for mixed feeds because the lithium ion battery volumes have traditionally been quite, quite low uh, and has been driven by co the value of cobalt. But at the same time, electric vehicle batteries will contain less and less of this cobalt, as we well know. And the main challenge for the recycling processes is that this material is actually very heterogeneous. In terms of both gem chemistries, uh, cathode chemistries come in. There are so many different cathode chemistries. And uh, also, the geometry of the cells and the battery modules is a problem for the treatment. And of course, there are these hazardous components that need to be made safe. Um, the existing processes are quite complex chains of different types of processes, as was. Uh, discussed earlier, but in, in a bit more detail, uh, this pre-treatment basically eliminates the hazardous components, or if not uh, eliminate, then makes them bearable and uh, prepares a concentrated material for further processing. This is the black mass. Um, 
not all processes require pretreatment. Some pyrometallurgical processes can tolerate entire modules, such as the UMICAR process. These pyrometallurgical processes have been mainly, mainly used in the past, very good for nickel, cobalt, copper rich batteries. Perhaps lithium recovery is also possible from the slags. Um, but uh, this also requires hydrometallurgical refining. And um, my topic has been mostly in the hydrometallurgical side. And, and typically, these sulfuric acid solutions are used, used for leaching. Uh, it's economically, economically the most relevant. Um, and as I said, not on, there are not only one type of process involved in these process chains. So pre-treatment, pre uh, hydrometallurgical, pyrometallurgical process will be used in all kinds of combinations. And basically there are no, I would as a metallurgist say that there are no typical recycling processes for these batteries. And uh, it's the optimal solution is, is somewhere, somewhere to be found. And uh, there are some research trends that I have noticed or have picked up some, some things that are interesting. Just, just this automation in pretreatment is, is very, very important for our safety, for safety perspective. Uh, the recovery of more, more materials and battery. So far, we have been very focused on lithium and cobalt, um, maybe nickel. But graphite and electrolyte will become, become a thing that needs to be tackled also. And um, these lithium iron phosphate batteries have being a bit of a specialty of China, but they are coming also to Europe. So finding some ways to treat them is also one of the next big, big things that needs to be considered. There are also these direct cathode recycling processes that are, have been suggested. Um, they remain a bit in question, it's very questionable if they can be used in industrial industrial scale. But I am excited to see how that will happen. But this would avoid the material separation, which is quite intensive. But one thing that I have been mostly focused on is this sort of life cycle thinking and eco design. And um, from here, we get to the sustainability assessment. And I would like to acknowledge that there are other types of sustainability than environmental. Uh, economic sustainability and social sustainability all play a role, but I tend to talk about this life cycle analysis or life, environmental life cycle analysis, LCA, basically. And um, social sustainability is, is more difficult to measure, but these methods are being developed. But uh, People tend to know life cycle assessment quite well as a term, but it's this standardized framework for the evaluation of, of the environmental impacts of products or processes. It is ISO standardized and consists of these four stages. And to start with, it's always important to consider the audience and what, what is included, the scope of the study, uh, what, is, what are you actually being me measuring in the study. From there, you get to the intensive part, which is the inventory analysis, where the inputs and outputs are defined. There are different methodologies for you doing this. Uh, the impact assessment, which in, sh in short term is the, is the calculation of the indicator impacts. And then inter interpretation always follows. And interpretation is very important in finding if the results are even relevant, what, what affects the results, what are the hotspots what scenarios are there. And this is a very iterative process. So uh, they, all, of the, all of the steps are constantly changing depend when the study moves forward. Um, and uh, we have obviously been discussing as a society, as societies and, and, and quite a lot about global warming and greenhouse gas emissions. But we need to remember that there are other uh, uh, other types of environmental impacts that products and processes have, such as acidification and eutrophication, toxicity, uh, resource consumption. Many of these impacts are, are more localized, and global warming is, is one that affects us all, obviously. 
but from here uh, there are also these endpoint indicators in some implant calculation methodologies. This is an example from the RCP impact assessment methodology. And these are these ecosystems effect, effect, effect on the ecosystems, human health and, and resource depletion. Um, uh, these eco in the endpoint indicators can be very useful when discussing things to a non, non um, expert audience, but they have more high uncertainty because it's uh, quite farther down the line than these midpoint indicators, which are typically used or seen. And um, when talking about recycling, it never exists in a vacuum. There are also other life cycle parts in the battery, but in the life, life of the battery, which have sort of affect each other in a way. Uh, material extraction is an important point in the end of in the life of a battery and the impacts of what that batteries have, especially the cathode metals and current collectors, which are affected by ore grades, which are constantly dropping and the sourcing and, and type of the ores, of course, uh, where something is processed is quite important. And uh, one interesting point is that manufacturing of the batteries is quite energy intensive itself, and that, that itself is contributes quite a lot to the impacts of the battery. Not something that process engineers can perhaps solve. Um, and the use phase, what is most important is obviously the grid mix that powers battery and the aging, aging and life life length of the battery life. Second life is harder to quantify, at least from what I have seen. But what matters at the end of life, which remains a bit of a mystery, is, is what is being recovered and what type of process. Um, but it, at the moment, it has been looking like nickel, cobalt, copper, and perhaps aluminum recovery would have the most significant effect or beneficial effect on the on the end, end of life impacts, but uh, it seems that graphite might be one of one very intensive to produce from produce also. So that is one example of how this knowledge uh, knowledge is being constantly added. So the more data we get, uh, the less of a mystery this is. Um, in the investigation of future processes, this type of simulation-based approach is highly invaluable, uh, enables quite, quite detailed look into the impacts of a process through the mass and energy balance that can be obtained from the simulation software. Uh, the software can be anything like Aspen Plus or HC Sim, that is method text tool that I have been using. Um, and uh, these inputs and outputs from, are modified into an inventory. Uh, modification may be needed. But that this approach starts with data collection using experimental work or just literature analysis. There is quite a lot of literature and different, different process steps already. Um, depending on the software, the data might be a little bit different and, and the data quality might, might also be, be different. The process model requires, um, the more process model is conducted for the mass balance and the mass inventory is calculated with the different softwares. There are different life cycle assessment softwares, including GABI, SIMAPRO, OpenLCA. And, um, after this interpretation step, this is done by the done, done uh, simulation can be also very useful in interpreting the results. Just discussing crystallization, what environmental aspects are there in the crystallization steps themselves. It's mainly the energy consumption that, that affects these steps themselves, but the, these steps do not exist in a vacuum meter, so the entirety of the process affects, affects what goes in and what comes out. Uh, these purity requirements are, are very high, of course, so there might be further refining that is always required. 
and that increases the complexity and, and that way can affect the impacts. And um, as was stated earlier, these raffinates are typically very rich in sodium and sulfate. And uh, I have heard that this sodium sulfate salt is becoming a bit of an issue because it's very difficult to valorize and uh, it, it's not landfillable. And uh, just an example from flow sheets, uh, there are many crystallization steps involved also in this, this step, this, this flow sheet, this synergistic leaching. Mm, cobalt, nickel and manganese are often recovered as sulfates and lithium either as hydroxide or carbonates. In, we have also been studying li lithium phosphates and that's a slower solubility, which can be quite, quite interesting, but it's not such a useful product in my opinion. Um, and indeed the sodium sulfate is, is a, I, I say co-product, but it might also be waste. We have also seen that this co causes combined processing of lithium ion and nickel metal hydride batteries can be beneficial for both of the for both of the batteries. There is synergy in leaching lithium ion ion batteries require reductive leaching and nickel metal hydride batteries require oxidative. But the problem becomes that nickel metal hydride battery volumes are quite much lower than lithium ion. A practical example from just from uh, global warming out zone depletion, I, I selected for this, but uh, this recycling process that I'm describing has ne negative net impacts for life cycle for raw material production in all categories other than the ocean depletion potential. Uh, this is mainly due to the consumption of sodium hydroxide. It's, it's very intensive to produce. But in sodium sulfate crystallization was not necessarily uh, needed in this flow sheet, but it has significant benefits for the process, uh, including the fact that sulfate is, is removed from the wastewaters. But this is chemically highly intensive process. I, I think that was one of the questions that was asked. Yeah. Um, not necessarily energy intensive chemicals contribute quite a lot. And, and I have found some ways to reduce the chemical consumption or some ideas on how to do that. Mm, that is more future topic. And a quick highlight that uh, low that uh, renewables are increasingly being used for energy production, and that has quite a significant effect, especially if the whole value chains become greener. Uh, it reduces nearly all impacts from from production processes, but it should be noticed that these renewable technologies require more metals and. Uh, this mineral, mineral resource depletion increases as a result. So it might be important already now to think about the fact that focus may shift in the future from greenhouse gas emissions to resources quite heavily. Just something that I would like everybody to maybe remember from this presentation is that life cycle assessment can be also used to optimize processes. And, uh, the fact that these lithium ion batteries are not designed for recycling is a bit of a problem from the process side. Uh, these processes are so complex. And I would, uh, I would like to also see some very sound ways to the sodium sulfate problem. And I would also like to acknowledge my co-authors and, and, and my, my professor. And thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Maria, uh, for the very nice and interesting presentation, um, which is really giving us uh, an overview of all the other uh, different issues revolving around uh, crystallization. So there is much more uh, to what we have seen in the first two presentations. And I um, 
I, I found particularly interesting the comment on uh, the shift from uh, greenhouse gases emission to uh, raw materials. I, I, I also have the, the same feeling. All right, so let's see uh, questions for uh, Maria. Again, let me uh, remind everybody that um, when asking a question, you should put it in the question and answer box. And also, if you can put the name of the speaker you are addressing the question to, that would be very helpful. So the first question is related to slide 13 um, and comes from uh, Christoph Duig. It is mentioned that the energy footprint of evaporative crystallization is uh, partially solved by integration. And so the question is, where does the required heat uh, comes from? Mm, I'm, I think the heat usually comes from steam. But is, is uh, this steam uh, um, coming from the same process or is it uh, uh, produced uh, uh, specifically? I mean, is the steam the waste of another uh, related process? Do you know if there is some form of uh, integration in this type of plants? Uh, I would say probably dependent. I'm not sure about crystallization processes, but uh, this uh, waste heat, this can be used very effectively, but uh, I'm not an expert in, in this area myself, but I, I would imagine that it might be possible. Right. So um, a follow-up question on this, uh, which is also a question that I had, which is also related to uh, slide 14, um, is again uh, asked by Christoph, and the question is, uh, would it be beneficial to use anti-solvent crystallization instead of evaporative crystallization? Um, it maybe depends on, on what, uh, what the chemicals are being used and how they are being used. It's always, always need to notice that you need to manage the chemicals throughout the process or however long that process chain is. So depending on, on the chemicals themselves, it might be beneficial or, or, or not. Yes. Um, do, you have, do you have an idea of what is the current situation? I mean, at the moment, how effective is the entire battery recycling uh, system? Do you have numbers in mind uh, that tell us uh, how many, what fraction of the batteries are actually recycled and what instead, what fraction instead goes into landfill or incineration? And then uh, from, uh, from, from that fraction that is being recycled, um, do you know what is the current technology used and what is the uh, current yield of these processes? Are there many recycling battery plants in Europe? Or is this an industry that yet has to come? Uh, from the numbers about how many batteries, uh, at, uh, most of there are not having to be in so many electric vehicles yet on the roads, but the batteries that are being recycled are quite I have been these portable batteries and the problem with them is that the consumer behavior in part. Uh, so I would imagine that the audience can uh, find that they maybe have some end of like spend, spend batteries in their own homes in, in the form of, in, of end of life computers, yeah, mm. other gadgets. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, uh, I, I think the goal 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 for recycling is is something might be wrong, but 60, 60 or sixty five percent. But uh, at the moment, it's even less. I would imagine. Not quite sure about this. I need to check myself. Yeah. But um, that, um, yeah, I'm quite hmm. optimistic about what will happen with cars because. With cars, we can rely, for example, on uh, uh, a very um, efficient network, uh, yes. which is based, for example, on uh, uh, recycling of catalytic convert converters. 
So this is a huge business in, uh, in Europe and not only in Europe, and this is extremely efficient. So basically almost the totality of the catalytic convent converters are being recycled and uh, uh, the many precious elements that are uh, metals that are included in the catalytic converter as catalyst material is already being recycled. And that is extremely efficient, is working very well. So yes. probably through the same channel, uh, we should be able to at least have the infrastructure to collect the batteries and, uh, and do some simple pretreatment, right? Yes, and uh, another great success story is the lead acid batteries, which are almost completely collected and recycled. So that might change do the be in the vehicles and um, there are recycling plants in 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 europe the umicor plant is is one of them and some plants are being at the moment uh, are, are being built at the moment also in in europe including finland uh, also sweden i i know that mm -hmm. but well, yeah one uh, one last uh, question um or or comment if you want um goes back to one of your concluding remarks i think it was um, which is that lithium-ion batteries are not designed for recycling and that is uh, uh, you know implying that uh, we need to design uh, batteries but in general we need to design uh, objects that are easily disassembled and can be recycled um, so I'm aware of a couple of uh, European initiatives on this, uh, but most of the other projects uh, I, I'm aware of uh, really focus on the energy density problem and the efficiency, but I haven't seen uh, much uh, uh, serious thought about this point, designing a battery that then can be easily recycled. What, uh, what is your take on that? Do you have any uh, information to share with us? There are some pro pro projects about, especially the um, how to are, are some projects on the design for recycling. Not especially the modules can be designed so that they are more easy to to uh, disassemble. But yes, uh, this is, has been a bit of a problem also for other other types of gadgets that they are very difficult to take apart yeah all right so i think it's uh, time to move on to the next uh, presentation thank you very much maria that was very nice and uh, and very uh, interesting um so um, i um, also invite maria to stay connected until the end of the talk for a panel discussion um right so uh, now we move on to uh, the presentation delivered by sergio carillo uh, sergio obtained his phd in chemical engineering from the university of manchester in 2019 where he has worked as postdoc for uh, a bit more than one year and is now um, um, working at university college london um, and also a part-time lecturer at uh, Tech de Monterrey in, Me in Mexico. And these research interests include the multi-phase processing and modeling. Um, so this is something we share. Um, I see your presentation on the screen. Uh, Sergio, the floor is yours. Also for you, 20 minutes for the presentation and then 10 minutes for discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can see you, hear you and see the screen. Yeah, small correction. I'm working in uh, University College Dublin. So yeah, sorry, my apologies. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, sorry. yeah, no, not a problem. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. I'm very happy of having so so many participants in this uh, in, for this session. So I will be talking about a novel intermediate that was discovered by our colleagues in the Faculty of Chemistry. And we, from the chemical engineering point of view, were basically looking on how to scale up and to see if this novel material could be used uh, commercially. Okay, so from the, in the engineering department, it's uh, Dr. Stephen Ferguson and I, and in the School of Chemistry, we have all these collaborators directed by uh, Tony Keane. 
which first discovered this material basically by mistake. And uh, well, does look quite promising. And I would also like to thank, of course, our sponsors, the SFI in Ireland and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And currently we're working with We Ireland. It's a recycling company on how to implement this, uh, this process, the process we're uh, envisioning for it. So a little bit of background. I think uh, many speakers have already touched on this. So for commercial LCO batteries, we basically have lithium ions, which are in the inner layer of graphite. And once we open the valve or we start using uh, our batteries, these lithium ions uh, migrate to the inner layer in between uh, cobalt oxides, basically. And this occurs with an electron uh, that basically uh, migrates and gives us the power. Okay, so these lithium ion batteries are becoming more important every day with the use of our laptops, our smartphones, and with electric vehicles in the future. Okay, so there are new regulatory frameworks coming from the European Union and some of the targets for the next uh, decade is that uh, we should be recycling about 95% of our cobalt and 70% of our lithium. So this is, there's still a, a lot of work ahead of us, especially considering that we're not doing much for lithium nowadays. Okay. So as we all know, one of the main issues with cobalt, it's, it's supply and also the, some human issues that have been documented especially in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And within the European Union, we're estimating that we will be using five times more cobalt by 2030 and 15 times more cobalt by 2050. And nowadays we are only recycling 22% of the cobalt that enters the European Union. Regarding lithium, we can also expect that the demands will increase exponentially. We're talking about 60 times more lithium by 2050. And that's the reason why lithium started being considered a critical raw material in the European Union in 2020. Nowadays, even there is lithium, even though there's lithium being mined in the European Union, most of it or leave the European Union for further processing. And we're importing most of our lithium, especially from Chile, the United States and Russia. Okay. Now, a little bit more background on the LCO materials. They were first synthesized by the Nobel Prize winners of Mitsushima, Jones, Weissman, and Goodenough. And they produced these first batteries by a calcination of lithium carbonate and cobalt carbonate at 900 degrees, or quite a high temperature. And they did so for 20 hours. And the reason why we require these very high temperatures is because lithium cobalt oxide uh, has two different forms. The low temperature form, also known as the spinel form, forms at 400 degrees, whereas the high temperature one, the layer structure that we want for our material, for our batteries and that have the best performance are only formed at these high temperatures. And that is because, well, again, these layer structures promotes an easier uh, lithium ion exchange. So this is a schematic devised by our, by our colleagues in the School of Chemistry, where we, we believe that these novel precur precursor or intermediate fits in. So we start with our battery ash, also known as black mass, we go through our leaching process. We synthesize our precursor named PM1. We go through calcination. We obtain our LCO material. We produce our battery. We put them in our laptops, on our phones, etc. And then we recover the cathode materials through grinding and so on and go back to our black mass. Okay. So now I'll talk about this novel precursor. Now, this, this novel precursor basically uh, presents these multiple layers. It has a layer formed even 
even before calcination. So in the figure on the left, you can see that we have here a layer of cobalt oxides, right? And in between, we have a layer of lithium ions. This is a perspective, if we're looking from the top, we can see here how the cobalt is arranging itself in octahedral form, and in blue one, you can see the tetrahedral form. Okay, so this is a very similar structure than what we would be expecting of our high temperature LCOs. And upon calcination, this novel material, the PM1, does produce the high temperature LCO and it does not form the spinal form. So this does look very promising. Okay. So from the engineering perspective, we have been working on scaling up the synthesis of, the, of PM1. And we have evolved our formula from formulation that required cobalt chlorides and bromides, sodium hydroxide, and we started getting rid of some of these elements that do not belong in the structure of PM1, so to make the downstream processing a little bit easier. And up to date, we're able to synthesize this material with only cobalt oxalate and lithium hydroxide. Regarding the scale up, we're still working in batch, but we have evolved from what the our, the chemistry in our department were using, which were par bombs, which they would put inside an oven for eight hours at 230 degrees and very small volumes of 15 milliliters. We first scaled up this process just by making the volume larger, but keeping the conditions very similar, 230 degrees, eight hours, 100 milliliters, using a high pressure Hastelloy reactor. Okay. Uh, the next advance we did is that we were able to synthesize this material just using a round bottom flask in reflux at 100 degrees, at least for four hours and 100 milliliters. And finally, the next uh, obvious step in scaling up was actually using an Optimax with an anchor, get very nice mixing, 100 degrees, four hours, and we were able to scale this process up to one liter. Yes, so this reaction, we can see while this reaction progresses, we can see a change in coloration. We start from pink, which is basically due to the cobalt oxalate, and we end up with a green slurry, which indicates that that cobalt is in its octahedral state. Okay. So at least at atmospheric pressure and 100 degrees at its boiling point, it's a slurry to slurry reaction. The reaction does require a large excess of lithium and pH is, is quite important. Now, one of the struggles we had at the beginning of the project was how do we follow the kinetics? How do we know that the reaction is complete? Okay. So we have been tracking the kinetics using a combination of XRD and TGA. And here is an example of, of what we have been doing. So here the spectrum in black is basically what the chemists are obtaining when they are using their, their small power bombs, 230 degrees and so on. And in the blue one, you can see the one that we have been synthesizing just at atmospheric pressure for um, four hours, this one. So you can see that there, it, our material does share a lot of the peaks, but there are some extra peaks which coincide with cobalt oxalate. So we know that the reaction is not complete and we need to study the kinetics of this reaction and to, to be able to, uh, of course, scale up the process, make it continuous and calculate the mean residence time required. With TGA, we can observe that we, there are three uh, weight losses while increasing the temperature. And the first one has to do with the dehydration of cobalt oxalate dehydrate into its anhydrous form. The second one with a PM1 calcination. So you can already see that this calcination occurs at approximately 250 degrees. And the third drop would basically be the calcination of the cobalt oxalate into cobalt 
two, three oxide that did not react and was still present in our reaction. Regarding the calcination, it does have its own challenges, even though it's a low temperature. And that has to do, well, with the structure of PM1 itself. As you can see, we only have two lithium ions and we have five cobalts. And when we degrade it, we get a combination of lithium cobalt oxide and cobalt 2,3 oxide. Okay. So these materials, we have also proven that we are producing LCO using XRD. Now, in comparison, this, calcina this calcination occurs at 250, and the conventional preparation can take, requires at least 750 degrees up to 900, and it can take many hours or in even days, and many times this is calcined in batches. Now, this, this material, the CM1, the combination of lithium cobalt oxide and cobalt oxide, has been tested as a cathode material at the university, at the University College Cork. However, we cannot disclose the information because we're uh, filing a patent. It's being processed. Now, something they, they did tell us in a personal communication is that the performance of of this cathode material was fine. So it was not the best cathode material, but it did work uh, reasonably well. Now, you can imagine that the reason for, for that is that we do have some cobalt oxide in there. Okay. So if we were able to separate these two minerals, the performance of our battery uh, would increase, or at least we would expect so. So there are two different questions that we would like to answer at this stage of the project. And the first one is how does the ratio of these two materials uh, affect the performance of the battery? And for that, our colleagues in the School of Chemistry, they are, they are working on that. They are currently installing the glove box so that we can have the capacity to produce our, our own batteries. And the second question is, are these two materials fused in the same particle, or is it that uh, the lithium cobalt oxide and the cobalt oxide particles are, um, are independent? So with that aim, we're looking into ways of separating these materials. Now, the technique we're, we're trying to implement or that we're studying is fraud flotation. This basically separates two different minerals depending on their hydrophobicity. And as we can see in the curve, the zeta potential of cobalt oxide and lithium cobalt oxide looks quite different. And especially in between pH of around four and six, we can see that some particles are charged positively, whereas others are charged negatively. So the idea is to add a cationic surfactant that would attach to the negatively charged particles, in this case, uh, lithium cobalt oxide, make the lithium cobalt oxide hydrophobic so that it attaches to the froth instead of staying in solution. Okay, so to verify if the grain, if these two materials are fused in the same grain or not, well, we started just by using a commercial LCO and cobalt oxide provided by alpha SRs. So to prove that this froth flotation technique is useful in separating these two minerals. So, so far we have run some experiments using CTAP, which is a quaternary ammonia salt, positively charged, 0.1% weight in an aqua solution, control the pH in between four and six. As we had said before, and now we're working at very small, small scales, just separating one gram. And for a flotation time of 15 minutes. And so far we have been able to get 2.44 times more lithium in the upper fraction as compared to the lower fraction. So for that end, the procedure that we're following 
is that we collect the fraud, we wash and filter, digest with oxalic acid, we filtrate that, and we analyze the liquor in either, either AES or ICP to measure uh, the lithium concentration in the aqueous solution. This is an idea or a, a schematic of uh, where, from the engineering perspective, where we believe that we could fit this precursor. So at the end of the process, we have our fraud flotation column, where hopefully, or we expect to be able to separate lithium cobalt oxide from cobalt 2, 3 oxide, and that would fit into the beginning of the process. So provided that PM1 already have has these oxalate layers, we would uh, digest the black mass using oxalic acid. There are several publications on this topic and it has been fairly well studied with and without using hydrogen peroxide. And here we can see the digestion reaction. So it's oxalic acid with our LCO. This can proceed at uh, 100 degrees atmospheric pressure in order to form soluble lithium oxalate and our solid cobalt oxalate, okay, with some CO2 that is also formed. Something that is not documented in the literature because it's not that common is to digest cobalt oxide. Now, this is not found in the literature because normally cobalt oxide can also be used to create the LCO material when you calcine it with lithium hydroxide or lithium carbonate. So this is something that we also require to study. We have been able to, done, to do it non-systematically at 150 degrees with oxalic acid as well, in order to obtain that um, beautiful print, pink precipitate. Okay. Now, this lithium oxalate needs to be converted into lithium hydroxide, which is one of our two reagents uh, needed to produce PM1. And to do so, we could combine this lithium oxalate rich, rich solution with lime in order to obtain lithium hydroxide. This is quite a spontaneous reaction. This is fast and potentially calcium hydroxide could be regenerated by calcination and redissolving the calcium oxalate in water. Okay. Another way in which uh, lithium is recovered, that is, uh, is found in the literature, even though it's not done so, so often, is that uh, we add potassium carbonate to lithium oxalate, and we end up forming lithium carbonate, which is uh, solid, which precipitates. Once we get our lithium hydroxide from this stream and we get our cobalt oxalate from the other one, we could proceed to uh, the formation of our PM1 reactor. As I mentioned before, lithium needs to be in excess in order to be able to form PM1. And this is very easily attainable, provided that we only require two lithiums for every five cobalt. So just by controlling the recycle stream here or the purge, we would be able to control the ratio of lithium to cobalt in order to form PM1. This purge will also allow us to bleed off unwanted materials so that they don't accumulate during our process. And well, we still have a question, is it worthwhile recouping the lithium hydroxide? Now, how much lithium is used in this process will depend on the amount of impurities that we have, how large this perch needs to be, and it also will depend on the performance of our fraud flotation column. Okay. So after forming PM1, which is the crystal, we filter it, and then we proceed to, to our furnace, we calcine our material, with our, we get our combination of our two powders, lithium cobalt oxide, cobalt 2, 3 oxide, and hopefully use fraud flotation in order to separate these two minerals and recycle 
the cobalt oxide back to our process. The performance or how green this process is will really depend on, on the fraud flotation and on the impurities that we might accumulate in our process. Okay. Now, moving beyond uh, PM1 or uh, classical LCO material, the chemists have also been working. We have, a, there is a PhD student working on this and see how uh, we can create MNC batteries. We have been able to, yes. Pedro, yeah, uh, we are already in the Q&A um, uh, session part. So if you could uh, wrap it up. Ah, yes, is... this is the last uh, slide. Wonderful. Great, thank you. Sorry. Yes, so if the chemists now, they are working on see how we can create a PM2 and beyond, and what is the ratio of nickel and manganese that can be put into the same structure in able to be able to, to create NMC materials out of PM2. Well, thank you very much once again. Uh, thank you to all my collaborators. Thank you, Sergio. That was um, very nice and very interesting. And um, um, a nice complementary presentation with respect to the other ones. So um, let me see questions. Um, so I see there is a question from Peter. Is the purity of the floated material good enough for using in the battery? That is something that we still need to answer. We're currently installing our glove box. We know from our from the studies that were done in court that it can be used as a battery material. At the time being, I believe it's a downgrade from commercial LCO. But if we were if we were capable to separate the cobalt oxide, we believe that uh, it would increase. But at the moment, yeah, we don't know and we cannot disclose the information we have now. Right. So there is another question from Christoph, um, who is uh, actually stealing all the questions I wanted to ask. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, the question is, could you please comment on the challenges of uh, upscaling, in particular with respect to product purity and yield? So I'm not sure if um, the question refers only to the first step or the separation step, but maybe you can try to address the question overall. Yes, fraud, uh, scaling up fraud flotation, it can be quite challenging. Or, well, uh, I, I'm not per se uh, an expert in fraud flotation. However, it's a hot topic of study as well, of how to scale it up from, for example, this small column. Now, for the time being, we're concentrating in a proof of concept and uh, not in the optimization of this one. Now, regarding the reactor for PM1, it also does become with its challenges because we, well, I, I've noticed that when we were using an Optimax with an anchor, of course, our crystals became so much smaller as compared to the ones that our uh, colleagues in the Department of Chemistry get without any agitation whatsoever in their small power bombs. And there are some concern about uh, oxidation when the particles are too small and how it interacts with the environment. So definitely something to consider how uh, agitation affects the quality of our product. Yeah, there was also a comment uh, made before uh, in the chat, uh, I think concerning mixing, of course, uh, uh, mixing is crucial in all the uh, processes that we have discussed so far. And, uh, and it plays a very important role in uh, scale up. Um, Right, other questions. Um, so I have one question concerning the performance of the cathode material. Um, in, in my experience, uh, based on uh, uh, you know, the collaborations I have with chemists, uh, electrochemists who have been working for a very long time on batteries, they typically look, uh, so they typically take the material, they assemble the cell, they typically start with the coin cell, and then they do um, galvanostatic cycling. And uh, they look at two uh, points, uh, two elements. One is uh, the initial capacity of the uh, electrodes, we're talking about the cathode here in particular, in the very first cycles. And then there is a capacity fading 
related not only to what happens to the cathode, but also to what happens to the anode uh, related to the formation of the uh, solid electrolyte interface at the anode and the cathode. So my question is, when you said that, your, that the feedback you got from your colleagues is that uh, this was working um, um, uh, decently well, let's say, do, do you know what type of measurements they did and what type of uh, evaluations they performed? No, I, I joined the project before that occurred. So all the information I have is basically from uh, our, the counterpart from uh, our colleagues in the School of Chemistry. So yeah, so that's, I don't know. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so another question um, is related to the final composition. So you mentioned that uh, there was still oxalate in uh, um, some of the crystals. And, uh, and then you mentioned that, that uh, you know, um, if, um, uh, designing this, the, the, the process with the proper residence time, the issue is solved. But is, is this uh, just a matter of time, uh, which is important, of course, because you know, a residence time of one hour with respect to three hours has a huge impact on the cost of a process uh, but but maybe um, the question is is there something else uh, maybe even if you waited a very long time um, you have a system that is kinetically trapped somewhere yes so that's a very interesting question and we're actually looking into that so at the beginning one of our issues was actually being able to track kinetics uh, there's a very different way in which chemists approach this sort of problem, especially when they're a specialist in crystallography. Because many times they get more excited about getting uh, new crystal structures and they put everything at the same temperature, their power bombs for many hours. But we as engineers were more concerned of, of okay, how do we make this productive? All right, so at the time being, uh, we, we haven't perceived that, the, that it's kinetically trapped. However, it does seem to evolve quite slowly after, after six hours. So I don't believe that atmospheric pressure we will obtain 100% uh, conversion of the cobalt oxide, oxalate, sorry. So yeah, definitely look into that. We know that at higher temperatures, it is attainable because the chemists basically are getting 100% uh, conversion or very close to 100. So, but uh, again, we, here we, we would also need to analyze the economics of the process because making be, being able to synthesize PM1 at atmospheric pressure offers a lot of advantages. Sure. Yeah, but that's um, an interesting point to yeah. explore in the future. All right, very good. So I think um, we can thank again uh, Sergio Carillo from University College Dublin. Let me say it right uh, this time, and and we can move on to the very last uh, uh, presentation of uh, of uh, the spotlight talk, which will be a, a presentation given in tandem by uh, Daniel Winter from Fraunhofer Institute in Germany and Andrea Cipollina from University of Palermo. So the title of the talk is Crystallization of Lithium for uh, Salt Work Brines in the Circular Mine Project. And um, let me say a few words about our speakers. Uh, Daniel has a PhD in mechanical engineering, uh, 12 years of experience in the research group Water Treatment and Separation at the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems. And he has been working on membrane technology, evaporation technologies, electrochemical processes and filtration, especially the implementation of separation technology in industrial environment and field applications. Andrea Cipollina instead is a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Palermo and the research fields uh, focus on desalination technologies and innovative solution for the recovery of energy and raw materials for brines and is the coordinator of the uh, uh, Horizon 2020 uh, European project Circular Mine. So uh, Sergio, uh, sorry, um, Daniel and Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, Daniele, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Very glad to be here with my colleague Daniel to present uh, our project and uh, with particular focus, the activities on crystallization of lithium from 
Saltworks brines. And yes, I will start with the introduction of the project and then I will leave the floor to Daniel, who will present uh, the activities on the recovery of lithium carbonate from lithium rich alloys, passing through the methodology that we have adopted and showing the preliminary results uh, obtained with the two precipitation routes that we have investigated. So about the project, uh, circular processing of seawater brines from saltworks for recovery of valuable raw materials. So the title is self-explaining. This is a, a EU funded project, 6 million euros budget, four years duration. We are more or less in the middle of the project. And the project is coordinated by the University of Palermo, but it has a very rich consortium of uh, 12 partners coming from academia, industry, small medium enterprises, all around the Mediterranean region. Now, the concept, the concept is fully related to the idea of circularity. It is based on the uh, use of bitterns generated in saltworks. Saltworks are the, the places where natural evaporation from the sun and the wind uh, allows the um, obtainment of natural sea salt from seawater. But saltworks also generate a very minerals rich bitter. Uh, in particular, the, mo most ri the richest element are magnesium, lithium, and um, bromides, boron, other trace elements that we aim at recovering by developing specific selective separation technologies that are fully integrated in a circular approach by using the waste stream from one step as a feed stream to the next one and closing the loop with two important auxiliary technologies uh, that are basically um, electromembrane steps for the in-situ generation of reactants, the same reactants that are then used in the separation steps, and also the use of reverse electrodialysis for uh, electricity generation from the remaining salinity gradient of sodium chloride solution exiting from the treatment chain. And last but not least, uh, yeah, I want to mention that a possible upwind integration of our scheme uh, can also foresee the use of a desalination plant that generates fresh water from seawater, but also a concentrated brine that allows for a full enhancement of the entire uh, circular scheme productivity and capacity. Now, for the sake of brevity, I will just uh, quickly look at the three core technologies and then introduce the, the work on lithium. The selective separation of magnesium is uh, obtained by a uh, mm, reactive crystallization unit, um, mainly aiming at a good control of the crystal size granulometry, which is an important parameter for uh, marketability of our product. Second step is the lithium separation, which is attained by a membrane flow capacity determination. In this respect, we are developing lithium selective membranes and uh, you know, special geometries for optimized fluid dynamics for the flow capacity uh, electrodes. And the third core technology is the so-called trace elements pH swing adsorption. So uh, an adsorption desorption process with a pH swing using very selective sorbent material with selectivities even above 1000 that will allow to separate trace elements are, uh, present at very low concentrations. But let's focus on the lithium extraction step and the lithium recovery process chain. As I said, we can um, separate by means of lithium selective membranes, lithium from the brine going to a lithium rich alloy, which still needs to be concentrated. And we will use an evaporative membrane hybrid approach to concentrate this, this lithium rich alloy up to a concentration around five grams per liter, which is then conveyed to the crystallization unit based on reactive crystallization approaches. There are two approaches that we are investigating, uh, but this is the focus of the work that Daniel will present. So I would leave now the floor to Daniel, who will continue showing the preliminary results of our experimental activities for lithium carbonate precipitation. Daniel. Thank you, Andrea. Hello, 
uh, everyone. Also, a warm welcome from my side. I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah, so we have uh, to treat these uh, lithium rich brines. We have selected to characterize two um, precipitation routes for the production of lithium carbonate as a, a material. Um, the one is a classical um, way of precipitating it with sodium carbonate. And the other one is to use um, CO2 insufflation uh, in combination with a high pH values in, in order to carbonate uh, the lithium from solution. The uh, core of, uh, of the experimental work is the identification of suitable precipitation conditions and the sensitivities of the system in terms of how much uh, carbonate is uh, required at the temperature. An important uh, aspect is the ionic strength since we need to precipitate the lithium from um, high ionic strength solutions, uh, these concentrated seawater brines, and the role of bivalent contaminants, especially magnesium, with, which is um, dominantly present in these uh, brines. Even though it is already extracted in the process chain, there is still uh, low concentrations of uh, contaminants uh, there. We, um, evaluate the process in terms of the KPIs, the recovery and the purity, so how much of, uh, of the lithium in the solution is, uh, is extracted and what is the mass uh, fraction of the lithium in the, in the product. So I guess most of, of you are uh, familiar with that. So the, the recovery in this uh, precipitation system is limited by the um, remaining lithium in the saturated solution, so basically directly depends on the saturation level of lithium carbonate, which is uh, decreasing with temperature. And also the role of the initial concentration is important uh, in order to, ma to make the limit a bit lower what the remaining amount uh, is doing in terms of, of the fraction. So the high temperatures and high initial concentration enhance the lithium recovery um, in, in our system. And as stated by Andrea, if we start with um, concentrations in the range of four to five grams of lithium per liter, we expect recovery rate uh, in the range of uh, 50 to 70%. Uh, based on these ideal binary uh, solubilities uh, listed here. We have uh, done experiments uh, with a simple uh, batch setups um, by placing um, different comp composition uh, liquors in, in our batches and um, then uh, have that uh, in a chamber that is uh, controlled in temperature and a dose, uh, our reactant to sodium carbonate um, and st under steering and then followed by an, by an aging phase. And uh, this similar thing uh, when we do the experiments with CO2 insufflation, uh, but here also important to track the pH value during the experiment. I first want to give some impressions uh, for selected um, results for the sodium carbonate uh, precipitation route. What we can see here in the, in the plot is the formation of the lithium uh, concentration uh, over time um, in our um, baker. When we start um, with our initial uh, concentration of four grams per liter, and we start the dosing um, of the sodium carbonate, we directly see um, how the uh, lithium content in solution decreases rapidly, um, indicating the precipitation. Um, what we can see then that it stabilizes um, at a certain level, which is slightly under the, under the uh, solubility limit of a binary mixture. Um, and we can also see um, that uh, um, the recovery um, is enhanced by higher temperatures because the solubility limit is lower. Also, 
if we go for a reaction at 50 degrees instead of 80 degrees, we see that the kinetics are a lot slower. And in a second um, set of experiments, we repeated these experiments on uh, based on a on a um, brine that contains a massive amount of monovalent salts uh, present in the seawaters, which is a sodium chloride and uh, potassium chloride. And we can see that this um, strongly affects the kinetics of the reaction, especially for the lower temperatures, and also enhances the recovery due to the sorting out effect. So the solubility of the salt, uh, of the lithium carbonate uh, reduces um, if the strong background salt is present. So if we compare um, different sets of such experiment and plot it to the ionic strength, we can see how the recovery is increased by that um, exceeding the expected levels from uh, the binary solutions. And um, another aspect to, uh, that is important to look at is the purity of the crystals that we um, receive. And um, it is more or less clear that we, if we have a, a high ionic strength uh, background solution, that uh, we receive um, some carbonate at lower, lower purity because uh, the surface, um, the wet surface after filtration still contains the dissolved um, salts, which then contaminate the surface uh, when drying. What we did is uh, we, washed, um, we washed the crystals with ethanol and by that step, we could remarkably increase the purity of the product, kind of proving that we had to deal with uh, mainly with surface contaminants. Uh, but it is also clear that by this washing step, we uh, lose a bit of uh, the yield of the product because part of the product is resolved in the washing solution. So a next um, selected result is a study that uh, refers to the uh, presence of uh, remaining small quantities of magnesia, magnesium in the water. Um, we can see that the presence of magnesium leads to a loss in recovery because it kind of co-precipitates uh, as magnesium carbonate and uh, grabs the uh, carbonate that is available for our lithium precipitation reaction. But here, the even more important aspect is the impact of, of the magnesium presence uh, to the purity of our product. Uh, and we can see that the magnesium presence lead to a, a strong loss uh, in the purity, which is explained by the fact that it co-precipitates as a carbonate. We can see that even when we um, implement the washing step, we cannot restore the purity, which proves that it is um, that we is not uh, relying on the surface contaminants of the monovalent salts. It is the, the co-precipitated magnesium um, carbonate that we cannot wash out by that. So now I want to jump in uh, the second series uh, of some experiments of the second series we have done using sodium hydroxide and um, carbon dioxide uh, dosing. First, I want to give you a bit an insight how the reaction takes place. Um, so what we can see that here again, it's the lithium concentration plotted with this uh, time uh, of the experiment. Uh, we see uh, the, the formation of the concentration of the lithium in solution and the pH value formation over time. When we, um, so basically first uh, sodium hydroxide is introduced um, and then uh, it, uh, the CO2 insufflation is getting started. And after that, the duration of the experiment basically starts and we see this kind of induction time. And uh, at a certain spot, we, re the, the, we see the, um, the solution to get a turbid and uh, we see the crystal uh, formation starts and also in the curve of the, of the lithium concentration, we see the strong reduction in concentration aligned 
um, with the reduction of the pH value, which is due to the fact that uh, the hydroxyl groups are consumed for the, for the car carbonation of the lithium. And then um, when the CO2 dosing is stopped at the threshold value, the pH of nine, we see that the pH is stable after that, and we have some kind of a, a ongoing reaction um, to, to that consumes the, le the leftover until we have our final uh, um, concentration. And it is uh, important, we have done a lot more of these experiments, and if the CO2 insulation is uh, lasting too long, then it, it starts to, the, the concentration of the lithium in solution starts to grow again because it resolves some of the already carbonated uh, lithium. So it's important to control the pH in, in this uh, precipitation group. Also here we have uh, done a study on the acceptance of magnesium in the solution. What we see here is um, the that we achieve recovery of about 80% uh, with this um, precipitation route. Um, and uh, that if we have the magnesium in solution that we have a purity that is quite poor. And even with the ethanol washing, we cannot uh, lift it uh, to towards very high value, uh, which is about the similar reason than in the, in the experiments before, because the um, magnesium is uh, present in the form of magnesium carbonate that we cannot wash out by the washing step. So what we did here is we utilized the fact that in this case, the pH shift um, and the um, addition of the CO2 is basically two different steps. So we can basically subdivide them and first um, shift the pH, then filter the solution and then start uh, to insulate the CO2. And in this way, uh, the magnesium already precipitates out in the, in the, after the first step and can get filtered out as a, a solid contaminant. So we have an intermediate refinement of the solution. And if we do that, we can see that the recovery is uh, not um, affected um, by this washing step because we do not filter out any of the lithium, um, but we can uh, remarkably increase the purity of the final product, proving uh, that uh, the magnesium could effectively be uh, washed out of the solution. So if filtration is applied, we, we have uh, repeated these experiments on a broader range of magnesium contamination uh, concentrations, and we can see that the recovery is not sensitive to the uh, magnesium content and also the final purity we achieve is not, not dependent on the magnesium concentration. So we can basically accept higher contamination rates. To uh, come to the end, I want to sum up a bit. So we have done experimental studies to uh, precipitate lithium carbonate from high saline brines containing about four grams per liters of lithium. We have uh, looked into two different uh, precipitation routes and characterized them. We have achieved recoveries in the range of 70 to 80 percent um, and um, purities of 80 to 90 for the high ionic strength solution, but if including a washing step, almost 100 percent uh, purity could be uh, achieved. The bivalent uh, cations significantly contaminate the product here. Um, the tests were done with magnesium. The product uh, washing uh, with these magnesium contaminants is not possible um, if these impurities come from uh, the bivalent carbonates. Um, if we use sodium hydroxide and CO2 precipitation route, uh, this offers an option for basically washing our feed solution before precipitating our desired product. And this route then offers a higher magnesium acceptance in the feed. And there's still a lot to do because it's quite a preliminary results. Um, so the ethanol washing 
and purity characterization must be studied in further detail because that was uh, just an early phase uh, and the purity uh, characterization also was more a uh, rougher indication, but uh, for sure it was not 100%, uh, but with the methods we applied, uh, uh, they were not detailed enough to go really into detail to see uh, um, what we have, what we have. So that must be uh, repeated um, with, with more precise methods. And then for sure, um, as we start building up the process chain in the field uh, with the with the salt in the salt works, we can access the real brines from the circular mine process chain and, and then um, test these processes um, with the real brines. So this is from my side. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I think we are open for your questions. Thank you very much, Andrea and Daniel, uh, for the presentation. Yes, it is time for questions, and there is one uh, already. Uh, it refers to slide 12 of your presentation, Daniel. And the question is, do you have an explanation of why the precipitation of lithium carbonate at 80 degrees shows a such different behavior at a lower temperature? Normally, solubility of lithium carbonate is lower at higher temperature, isn't it? And um, so a suggestion for a possible explanation is, was the pH value check not that it was shifted to the lithium bicarbonate area? You can also see, Daniel, the question written in the Q&A box. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, so, so for sure, the solubility at higher temperatures is um, lower. That is why the curves with the higher temperatures are uh, are low. Um, receive we receive lower final concentrations, which then transfers to a higher recovery because the the, the precipitated fraction is uh, higher. And this effect is a bit less pronounced if we have uh, if the solubility of uh, the lithium carbonate is, uh, let's say, has a more dominant uh, impact due to the background salt, and the, the, these two uh, temperature are, are closer to each other, but they are still um, reflecting this basic behavior that uh, the, the solubility at higher temperatures is is lower. Okay. All right. Um, I do have a question myself, um, which is related actually to the same slide. So you mentioned that by adding a monovalent salt, uh, the kinetics is uh, faster. So is it uh, just because of the ionic strength or uh, what is the explanation for that? Yeah, this is actually what we what we discovered. We did these experiments uh, based on uh, uh, the increase of ionic strength based on different monovalent salts. So we have done these experiments only with high ionic strength based on sodium chloride and only sodium chloride, only potassium chloride, a mixture, and also um, yeah. And by comparing these uh, results, they are all showing the same trend as, as long we are not adding uh, bivalent um, ions that then significantly contaminate our product, uh, then we, we always observe this strong impact on the kinetics, which is especially dominant for the lower temperature uh, experiments. Yeah. And uh, uh, besides measuring the lithium concentration in solution, which is what you're plotting here, uh, did you also look at the uh, crystals that are being formed? Are they yeah, yes, we have, uh, we have done several analysis with the crystals also. So what, what we have always done is uh, that we have um, filtered the crystals and um, analyzed them 
including the washing step or not by resolving them in a defined way and then uh, analyzing the composition, the, the different ionic composition, what we found in these uh, in the crystals. We, what we also have done uh, is SEM analysis to see especially, to especially how the contaminants uh, disturb the, the, the product um, um, shapes. Um, what we have not done is an analysis about the, the crystal form uh, our product is uh, present. Okay. All right. Um, another question I have is related to, uh, but wait, there is a question from the audience um, from Simon Schiele, uh, Technical University of Munich. Um, since you have uh, a decrease in, in saturation for increasing temperature, is there your uh, crystallization endothermal? We, we have, actually, I don't know. <laughs> in principle, yes, but we haven't observed significant temperature effect or that the system was thermostated and we did not investigate this aspect. Well, I wanted, if I can make a short comment on the importance of the results with the uh, high ionic strength solution. This is quite relevant for our product because uh, as I mentioned, the lithium is separated from the bitterns via a lithium selective membrane process. And membrane selectivity can be, let's say much lower with respect to uh, monovalent ions than with bivalent or trivalent ions, which are anyway removed in the previous steps of the integrated cycle. So that means the risk of having uh, sodium and uh, potassium chlorides in our lithium rich element is high, but it was good to find that this presence does not significantly affect, or at the contrary, it seems to be beneficial for the crystallization phenomena, apart from the, uh, let's say, need for the washing step due to the uh, presence of the liquor in the in the crystals that we form the lithium carbonate crystals that we form okay maybe one last uh, uh, a bit more general question um, so we, we saw from um, the uh, introduction that uh, uh, you're not recovering only lithium but you're also recovering magnesium um, so the presentation focused on lithium, but also magnesium is important also in perspective for batteries because uh, they are looking at other elements for making batteries. And of course they are looking at sodium, but also magnesium. So we never, we, we don't know what the battery in, of the future will be made of. Um, so my question is knowing um, the number of salt works that we have in the Mediterranean region, can you estimate uh, with a very efficient process uh, how much lithium and how much magnesium we could extract uh, given that the main product is uh, salt uh, for, for um, I guess, uh, the, the food industry? Uh, yes, we had, we had made an estimation. Uh, I have not the figures in mind. They, they will be published soon in a paper. Uh, but to give you an idea, in terms of magnesium, and we talk about magnesium hydroxide generation, the quantity that will be produced, let's say, will co could cover potentially uh, from 20 to 40 percent of the EU market. So it would be a very relevant amount. Uh, for lithium, the much lower concentration uh, re reduces significantly the, the potential impact. If I'm not wrong, we are talking about a uh, few percent, up to 10% of the uh, present market, but looking at the uh, I mean, ideal potential, recovery potential, uh, considering all salt works in, uh, in the Mediterranean area. All right, maybe one very last question for a very quick answer uh, from Alessandra Squali. Uh, did you prepare the membrane selective uh, uh, for lithium or was it a commercial product? 
they, they were, this is actually the activity of our colleague from uh, uh, IBET, which is a spin-off of the Universidad Nova, Nova de Lisbona, uh, the group of Professor Joao Crespo, and they have prepared, they have tested both commercial membranes, lithium selective membranes, but they have also prepared uh, their own uh, lithium selective membranes uh, with performances which are very good. They are in some cases even better than the best commercial available membranes. But the main, uh, let's say, achievement is that these membranes, uh, let's say, aim at uh, very low production cost. Let's say uh, in the range of few hundreds euros per square meter. While nowadays lithium selective membranes cost much more than 1,000 euros per square meter. All right. Also in this case, I think that there, there has been already one or two papers published and uh, more are, are in uh, preparation. Okay. All right. Yeah. And, and from the Circular Mind website, uh, um, all these papers will be able to be tracked by the audience. Yes. All right. So I uh, thank again Andrea and Daniel for the very nice uh, presentation. Then I ask uh, all the speakers to activate their camera again. Um, so that uh, everybody can see our faces for a bit of a panel discussion. Um, let me make a very quick summary of what we have seen, which I think was um, very, um, very uh, inspiring. So um, we have seen um, that crystallization plays a very important role in the production of battery materials, especially for uh, cathode materials but also in the recycling of batteries, um, that there are many chemical engineering issues involved from uh, modeling uh, to understanding the role of the, the interplay between thermodynamics and kinetics, uh, the role of mixing and uh, scale up and also scale down, because in some cases maybe you have a problem in an industrial plant and you want to study at the laboratory scale and so you also need to scale down the process to investigate that specific issue on, on, uh, on the laboratory scale. And then uh, we have of course the problem of um, um, making a thorough and complete analysis of all the elements that are uh, coming into the picture and of course LCA is offering uh, a potential tool for performing this analysis and then at the end, uh, um, a, a, a way to provide us with the amount of lithium and, uh, and, uh, um, and magnesium uh, in a sustainable and circular way. So um, if, uh, and I'm now talking to the audience, if you feel that uh, one of the questions that were asked were not fully addressed and you want to reformulate uh, the question, or if you think that I was too quick in um, uh, deleting the question and you want to re-ask the question to one specific um, uh, speaker or to all the speakers, uh, please uh, do so. I will start uh, and I suggest to do like this. We have about 15 minutes, so um, 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 we, we don't have much time. Um, uh, we can go around following the order of the presentation, but don't feel obliged to contribute to the discussion if uh, uh, you don't think you have uh, anything relevant to say, right? So um, one point I want to raise to all of you uh, is, again, uh, a bit of an obsession for me, which is scale up and scale down. Uh, because I see uh, my chemist uh, uh, colleagues developing uh, wonderful materials and uh, uh, working uh, very effectively in the lab, uh, but then uh, uh, very often, uh, even at that stage, you need to start thinking about the industrial process. And, and this is not done in many cases. So then it is in the, in the end of the engineers to uh, take a process uh, that was developed at the lab and bring it to the industrial scale. And then, of course, you know, there is not only the issue of uh, identifying the process conditions at the industrial scale that give you the same product quality of the lab scale, but in some cases, there is the entire rethinking of the process. 
So um, in this field, the battery uh, material production and battery material recycling um, is uh, scale up, scale down an issue or not? We can also not follow the order of, uh, of the presentations. So maybe I will start, which I, I, I'm the less expert in that. <laughs> but I can, I can uh, just make a comment about the, the concept that we, uh, on which we are working. So in the case of recovery of raw materials from bitterns, uh, the, the steps of recovering magnesium and uh, auxiliary units, so electromembrane processes for in situ generation of chemicals and energy production, they are at a relatively high TRL. TRL. So the, the potential for scale up is, is really there, it, it's evident, and uh, we do not see significant issues. While Selective separation of lithium and other trace elements, among which cobalt, for example, uh, there is a quite an important issue for, for the scale up due to the, uh, let's say, low TRL of materials, both in terms of selective membranes, but also selective sorbents uh, that are being developed, but also in terms of, of technology itself. Thank you. Anybody else wants to add uh, anything on this? Yeah, so probably I can proceed. And so, sorry, Dan, yeah, I, I wasn't aware that this question was raised to, to the speakers. Um, but um, yeah, for sure. I mean, for co-precipitation, I mean, you, you know this field quite well. It's, it's, it's always a tough topic to scale up, scale down, and adjust the product properties you get in small scale in the same manner as in large scale. And um, I mean, we, we have lab, ex lab vessels to, to exploit and develop materials. And it's really a tough task to, to get this on the plant in a, in a 10 KT line per year. And um, yeah, so every approach that helps here and, and we, we're already deeply involved in looking on some de process descriptors that may help um, uh, helps in this topic, right? I can add some remarks. Um, I think that we have the same problem as in precipitation in general, of course, but uh, uh, and especially uh, for the scale up or the hydrodynamics, the mixing the, the, uh, can be uh, representative at the lab scale of the what we have, will have it uh, in, uh, in in, the, in larger uh, vessels. But here we have uh, one thing more: the products are uh, acids or other um, um, gas emission or other type of products we have to handle. And uh, we have also to foresee technologies able to handle such products. And uh, in this part of the scale up, also we have to consider in the future continuous uh, systems, not only batches. I think so. Yeah. Any other comment on this? Um, on my side, just to echo what you said, uh, Daniele, yeah, the role of mixing while scaling up is quite important. And in my case, it even had to do with material selection. For example, we're playing with very strong acids. We're playing with some metals. So, for example, we started doing some uh, research in a Hastelu reactor, but we were actually corroding it quite badly. We were getting pitting corrosion. And this is uh, yeah, a problem we were not expect expecting to uh, expecting to encounter as the chemists in the lab were probably also only playing with vessels with uh, PTFE, for example. So in what you're to scale this up, uh, it also comes uh, with some challenges there, especially in battery production. Also the, um, I mean, also the issue that was raised by Beatrice now, continuous versus batch, um, is, is an interesting one. So I'm not sure 
what is the industrial practice on, on some of these processes. Uh, because uh, Lucas, for example, from your presentation, I, I got the feeling that uh, some of these reactors are multi-purpose reactors, so they are not used uh, uh, for, they, they are used for, for different products. Is that correct? And then if they are multi-purpose, does it mean that then it's mainly batch or a sort of semi-batch? Um, both, both fully correct. So, so it's um, we have to cover both types of processes. That means um, continuous processes and batch processes. And as shown, I mean the the properties you get, or depending from resi time, residence time distribution and and stuff like this, really depend on the manner of process you have. And um, I mean where it is possible, continuous process in in large scale. Um, much easier, but can also raise some some issues in in downstream. But um, okay. yeah, this is what Beatrice said is is is, is uh, for sure. It, it's an important topic. Something else that was mentioned that I found uh, um, a bit scary is the issue of uh, sodium sulfate. So I everybody uh, almost everybody mentioned the the, uh, the the problem what we are going to do with all this sodium sulfate, but nobody uh, gave a, an answer. Are, are I mean are there any thought uh, on what to do with these with all these um, sodium sulfate? Because I have no idea. I mean this is a truly yeah. genuine question. I I wouldn't know what to do with it. <laughs> yeah, uh, we are facing this topic very intense right now, and um, I mean there are ways. And now it's it's um, it's a question of of uh, cost and and sustainability to choose the right one. And um, I, I think there will come an, a result in the end because you have to to deal with this issue. But um, yeah, so far I I cannot give the answer. Okay. But yeah, I, I think it was reassuring to see that uh, Maria pointed out the problem of uh, greenhouse gases uh, uh, being the problem now and maybe tomorrow uh, the problem will be raw material. But then I guess with the last presentation, um, we, have a, uh, we have the hope that uh, you know, we will be smart enough to find uh, ways to recycle and reuse uh, and extract and recover all the critical raw materials that we need for uh, technologies of, uh, of the present and technologies of the future. All right, so I think, um, you know, lunchtime is getting closer and I see also that the number of uh, people attending the seminar is decreasing. Um, so uh, it's a kinetic problem and we know that the thermodynamic is gonna be zero. So um, I'm not sure if Giorgio and Martin want to say uh, something to close the spotlight talk. Well, I would like uh, to, I just would like to say that um, your talk was very well uh, organized. I was very impressed by the presentation and by the interaction you had of all the, among all the speakers and also the quantity of questions from the attendees, I think were, uh, was high and very much focused on the specific subjects. So clearly, I think you have um, treated the subject of uh, great interest for, for, for the audience. So I would like to express the, you know, my congratulations for all the work that you have done and for the quality of the presentations. As far as you know what to do about gypsum, uh, I think that uh, this is, uh, I think uh, if I remember well, in big power stations, there were uh, the same problem in the past. And one of the uh, of uh, utilization possible was uh, as um, uh, in the preparation of sub, sub base for materials for roads for road construction. So I think the construction industry could be a, utilization, util, a user of this type of uh, waste product so that it would be reutilized uh, for something different. But uh, these are uh, memories for the past, so I don't know if this is still... <laughs>
still uh, doable. Okay, so again, thanks uh, uh, to all, congratulations. And uh, I think that uh, your working party is doing uh, very well. It's very united and uh, I'm very happy about that.